attendees know. I'm going to put a note in the chat to please refer to the stream text. Excellent. For captioning. And perhaps you can drop it in again uh, when we let in everyone. And Katie Kale mm -hmm. is on now. Hi, all. Um, and just just as somebody who uses Zoom often, you may need to put that link in a few times during the session because anybody who joins, once they join, or if if we linked something before they joined, they won't be able to see it. So we may just want to do it a couple of times. All right, thank you. Thank you. Greg, um, are you ready for me to uh, yeah, let, make members of the public in? Or yes, let, let everyone in. Okay, bring them in now. Yep. And Greg, you can get started in about 30 seconds. Download yeah. Yeah. There's someone speaking. Uh, if you're speaking, please uh, mute your microphone. It's from a floor. Um. Good afternoon, this is Rosemary Access Board. Uh, we are about to begin. If uh, everybody in the audience could please mute your microphones and your cameras turned off, please. Gregory Fairback, uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to everybody who's uh, here to participate in the uh, October meeting of the United States Access Board. Uh, I'm Gregory S. Ferrybach. I'm the uh, chairman of the board. And uh, with me tonight, or this, actually this afternoon, is Ms. Katie Kale, vice chair of the board, and our director, uh, Sachin Pavan. Uh, we welcome everyone uh, who is uh, going to be attending with us. We will be uh, uh, live streaming as well as uh, uh, having our other uh, opportunities for uh, uh, messaging. So stay away or uh, stay aware. And we will make sure that you uh, are all uh, uh, in part of the uh, program as far as uh, uh, seeing the uh, information that we'll be presenting today. Um, at this point in time, uh, as I said, we this is the last meeting of the 2023 year of the Access Board. Our next meeting will be in January as we begin 2024. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to doing all that uh, uh, exciting uh, things for our, our uh, country uh, next year also. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Rosemary to give her the roll call. Rosemary, can you please uh, call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. This is Rosemary Banales, U.S. Access Board staff. Board members, when you hear your name, please say aye or present, rather. Starting with Elver Arisa Silva. Present. Thank you. Olivia May Asuncion. Hi, present. HHS Allison Barkov. Good afternoon. This is HHS liaison Brian Bard. Allison Barkov cannot attend. Proxy to the chair. Thank you. Veterans Affairs, Michael Brennan. Good afternoon, Mike Brennan, present. Department of Defense, Gilbert Cisneros. Department of Defense, Gilbert Cisneros. Department of Justice, Kristen Clark. Good afternoon, this is Eliza Dermody from the Disability Rights Section for Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark, proxy to the chair. Thank you. Department of Transportation, Christopher Coase. Present. Heather Dowdy. Present. Stephanie Enyard. Present. 
Gregory Fairbach. Present. Department of Education, Glenna Gallo. Department of Education, Glenna Gallo. Uh, Amy Hamrawi. Present. Hannah Ibanez, Ibanez, I'm sorry, Hannah Ibanez. <laughs> Thank you, present. Uh, Ms. Carmen Jones. Yeah. And I know that. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, GSA Katie Kale. Present. Alexis Kashler. U.S. Postal Service, Benjamin Kuo. K.R. Niu. Uh, we uh, we I'm sorry, is that K.R. Liu saying present? Okay, Benjamin Nadalski. Present. Tina Pedersen. Present. Department of Commerce, Jeremy Pelter. Madeline Rose Ruvalo. Present. Department of Labor, Taryn Williams. Present. Housing and Urban Development. Uh, staff liaison Rex Pace is present. And Department of the Interior. Uh, Sloan Farrell liaison. Uh, 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 to the chair. I'm sorry, I'm going to get the word. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very oh, much. Long day. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. And we appreciate everyone's participation. And with that being said, since we do have a quorum, I'm going to call for a vote of the March 15th, 2023 uh, board meeting. Uh, and uh, this can be done by either raising your uh, hand or a voice vote. So all those in favor of uh, approving our 20... Light or dark? March, March 15th, 2023 meetings, signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. I believe we have a, an approved uh, minutes. So uh, thank you all for participation. Uh, Rosemary showed that the minutes of the March 15th, 2023 are approved. Yes, Mr. Chairman, so noted. Thank you so much. At this time, we're going to call on our executive director, Sachin Bannon, for his uh, report and uh, as well as the year end uh, conversation that we'll have. So, Mr. Executive Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our October uh, board meeting of the U.S. Access Board. Uh, to start off, I want to welcome some new board members that we have had since our last board meeting um, that, that we had in March. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'll start off by recognizing four of our new public members. Uh, we have Stephanie Enyard from Washington, D.C. We have um, Carmen Jones from Georgia, Tina Pearson from Rhode Island, and Olivia Asuncion from California. And then from federal members, we have Glenna Gallo from Department of Education, and from Veterans Affairs, Mike Brennan. Um, I just want to welcome and congratulate uh, these uh, six individuals for joining our board, and we look forward to working with all of you. 
At this point, I'm going to cover the work that the Access Board has accomplished over the last fiscal year. As you all may know, the fiscal 2022 just came to a close and the Access Board has been very busy in various activities, uh, including rulemaking and other technical services that we provide. So I'm going to give you some highlights of the work that we have been involved in. We'll start with rulemaking. Public right of way accessibility guide, uh, guidelines. Uh, many of you know that we have finalized the uh, PROVAG rule. This was a rule that was being undertaken for a long time and it was finalized this year in August 8th. So I wanna congratulate all the staff who has worked on this and all our federal partners who have extensively worked on this over the, over the years to uh, see this to the finish line. PROAG will be legally enforceable once uh, Department of Transportation and Department of Justice adopt our rule. It, under the Architecture Barriers Act, it will be enforceable once the standard setting agency will, uh, will adopt the uh, uh, standards that we set. So uh, PROAG as part of our rulemaking process is completed. So now our process is going to be making sure that all the all the information that has been shared under this rule, it, we are providing technical assistance and training for, for this particular rule. The next rule is the medical diagnostic equipment. In May 2023, we issued an NPRM. This is to set a low transfer height of 17 for wheelchair chair users who would transfer from a wheelchair to a to a, to a chair or to a, a ex, exam table at the physician's office. We have evaluated the comments that we have received. We have received about 78 comments and we are in the process of getting the rule ready for OMB uh, review. We are also working with FDA, a collaboration with the FDA to make sure that they are aware about the, the work that we are doing in this particular rule. The next rule is the electric vehicle charging station. We're working on the notice for, notice for proposed rulemaking on this EV charging station to ensure all EV charging stations are accessible. Board members are currently reviewing the rule packet for this rule. Our hope is to have this rule ready for OMB review in the next couple of months. Uh, the board members will be voting on the rule packet uh, within the next month or so. Self-service transaction machines. We have reviewed the public comments that we have received for the ANPRM. And currently we are drafting the regulatory language for the, uh, for the MPRM. We are also drafting the PREA for this uh, uh, to, to support the MPRM as well. Our hope is to have an MPRM out to OMB and for public comment early next year. You would also notice one of the items on our unified agenda is the rail rule. Currently, we are working on the rail rule, but more emphasis is being put for the EV charging stations uh, for staff resource purposes. So once the EV charge, uh, charging station is completed or is in a stage that we can, uh, we can move the staff resources to that rule, we'll be focusing more on the rail rule. So um, I just wanna make sure that there is activity happening in the rail rule, uh, that just the emphasis for the EV charging station is taking more of the staff resources right now. Um, other than rulemaking, the, we, we spend a lot of staff resources on technical assistance and training to provide the TA and training for all the different rules that we are we have produced in the past, but also making sure uh, people have better understanding of the standards that we have produced. Over this last year, our staff in the Office of Technical and Information Services have provided over 
have received over 5,000 TA requests. This is, um, I believe, over a 17% increase from the previous fiscal year. We have provided about 127 webinars and trainings, reaching over 20,000 in individuals uh, via webinar and trainings. About 9,500 of this 20,000 was through webinars. And the breakdown for those webinars were about 6,800 was for the built environment and about 2,600 for the digital accessibility component. After the issuance of ProAg in August, we have, we have posted five trainings for ProAg on our YouTube channel. And within the first two weeks, we have received over 2,000 views just on the ProVac training on our YouTube channel. I want to touch a little bit about the work that's being done through our Section 508 team as well. Um, last December, Congress introduced the Consolidated Appropriation Act. That's a Section 752. So in collaboration with OMB, GSA, and OSTP from the White House, our staff has been working very closely to, to, to develop the um, accessibility criteria to ensure 508 compliance is being followed by all federal agencies. This assessment criteria wrapped up in August. All federal agencies were required to upload their uh, assessment by August 11th. Now we are working with GSA to analyze the data that was received from all the federal agencies. The goal is to have this data available to Congress by the end of this year. So December of this year, we will be, uh, GSA will be submitting this report to Congress. We, we continue to work with federal agencies to ensure accessibility of documents, accessibility of testing, all that is still being prioritized when it comes to Section 508. Uh, staff plays a key role in collaboration with GSA on a regular basis to make sure digital accessibility is not forgotten and there's ongoing improvement for federal agencies when it comes to accessibility. Now I'm going to touch on our ABA enforcement, Architecture Barriers Act enforcement. Over the last fiscal year, we have received 201 complaints and we have closed 167 complaints after 54 of them uh, was after um, corrective actions. This is an increase from the previous year on the number of complaints that was uh, closed. We have also improved our complaint tracking system, which has improved the ABA efficiency, uh, ABA enforcement efficiency as well. So this new system is in place right now. Pub public engagement out outreach is the next topic I want to touch on. Over the last fiscal year, we have sent out over 130 news releases. And we have almost to, close to 29% increase in subscribers for our various news channels. Uh, we have increased our social media presence. Access Board in the last couple of years has been putting a lot of emphasis on social media. All of our social media channels, that is Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or X, has seen a, a significant increase, especially over the last few months. On Twitter, we have over 200 followers, about 5,000 visits to our profile, about 10,000 impressions, and about 46% and about increase on LinkedIn. And about 20% increase in our Facebook posts. Our biggest, busiest 
social media channels are obviously our YouTube channel, which has all our trainings posted. We have had about 65,000. Um, we have 65,000 uh, people use our Facebook uh, channels this year or just over the last fiscal year and about 200 new subscribers all, over the last fiscal year. We're working on a communication outreach plan that you'll be hearing about from our outreach committee. This plan is to ensure a more broader outreach to the larger community over the next uh, three years. One of the work that we do at the Access Board is has obviously has a strong impact within the US, but it also has a strong impact globally. We get a lot of inquiries from foreign nations on the work that we do, and we get visitors from different nations on to better understand how the Access Board works on work on our regulations and how they can duplicate similar activities within their country. This year, we've been fortunate to have interactions with um, multiple countries uh, such as Korea, Peru, Moldova, Kyr Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, Indonesia, et cetera. We continue to have a strong conversation with the European Union as well, um, in, especially under the topic of digital accessibility. We have staff who are continuing conversations around what uh, accessible design should look like in the digital space uh, within the European Union. I'm going to touch briefly on our activities for our executive orders. We continue to focus on the various executive orders under the Biden and Harris administration, the work under uh, our work for the to outreach to the tribal nations continue as well. And we have reached out to various uh, tribal nations. We have participated in conferences uh, hosted by ACL. We have engaged in uh, conversations with Indian Health Services to ensure that federal buildings that are on reservations are also accessible. Um, both myself and Phil Brada on our public affairs team has we had a chance to visit a new facility in South Rapid City, South Dakota, to check out the accessibility that Indian Health Services is uh, made for this new hospital in, in South Dakota. Our conversation continues to, uh, to improve and we are trying to find ways to better outreach to the tribal nations to ensure the information that we have is useful to the tribal nations as well. We also continue to engage with our uh, congressional offices when inquiries come. One of, the, uh, one, one of the activities we have been engaged in is up to our to, through the Governmental Accountability Office. We are in an engagement with the GAO on 508 compliance. Um, this is the second engagement that we are engaged with the GAO. This is to the 508 engagement is to ensure that federal agencies are following 508 requirements. Uh, our first engagement on this particular topic was uh, just a few weeks ago in September. Uh, if you may remember, we were uh, involved in a different engagement uh, with the GAO over the last year. This was to ensure that um, the practices of access board collaboration with other agencies uh, was happening. And the report was published by GAO and GAO did not find any issues in the work that we were doing and supported the collaboration that we continue to do with our federal partners and other external partners. So those are quick highlights of the work that the Access Board has been involved in over the last year, um, rulemaking being a big portion of the work we do. But I do want to acknowledge the technical assistance and the training that we provide is a huge asset to the public and other partners that we have externally. But we also um, have had a lot of turnover over the last year. I want to introduce a few 
a new staff that has come on board that you may not have been aware about uh, since our last board meeting. We have had five new staff that has come on board. Um, first one is uh, Drew Gordon, our Director of Administration, um, India Thomas, who is our Financial Manager, um, David O'Keefe, who is Events and Communication Specialist, and under our Office of Technical Information Services, uh, we had two new accessibility specialists. One is Travis Sainer, and the other one is Deborah Martins. Um, the Access Board has gone through a lot of staffing changes through retirements, and we welcome the new team members who are excellent contributors to the work that we are doing. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I conclude my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Executive Director. Uh, on a personal note, and I know I speak for the entire board, uh, we thank you for your, your leadership uh, this past year and uh, uh, getting us uh, to where we are today. That's, uh, we're quite uh, excited about where we've come and where we're going. So I uh, appreciate your leadership and such. Pat, I'm sorry, got you. All right. Mr. Chairman, this is Rosemary Access Board. Yes. I would like to note for the record, please, if I may, Ms. Glenna, Gla uh, Glenna Gallo, Department of Education, is present by phone. And uh, Department of Commerce is uh, represented by liaison Larry Beat with a uh, proxy to the chair. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That sounds even more so our, uh, our quorum. So we will continue doing business and, and welcome everyone who just joined and those that. Uh, uh, I've been with us for a bit today, so thank you very much. All right, uh, it is now uh, a uh, portion of our meeting where we get to uh, hear from our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Brillen Swinner, and uh, she is a, uh, first off, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to, out today to come visit with us and, and talk about your uh, uh, participation in, in uh, things disability and uh, here in, in the United States. Uh, for everyone who hasn't ever met uh, Dr. Swinner, uh, she's an associate professor uh, at John Hopkins School of Nursing and holds an appointment at the John Hopkins School of Medicine and the John Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, she has a, uh, been provided a uh, advice and expertise on disability data, equity, and accessibility to multiple organizations and agencies. Most recently, uh, she was a speaker at the White House uh, of Science and Technology uh, this past summer, uh, as well as equity and excellence in the STEM field, which we all know is very important, uh, especially for our uh, colleagues with disabilities. Uh, she is a, the chair of the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering, as well as the medicine and the planning committee uh, for uh, disrupting albinism and advanced STEM uh, series on shared uh, disrupting uh, with the NIH advisory uh, committee on the director ADC subgroup. So uh, her work has been published in leading academic journals such as the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, as well as the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, and uh, Lancet. Uh, Dr. Swinner, I uh, will take uh, questions from the board after the uh, presentation, but I uh, welcome you and uh, thank you for attending today. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and thank you for the the kind introduction. I'm going to just share my slides, which of course always breaks down when you don't want it to. Um, all right, I think we're good. Okay, um, so thank you again. I, um, as was introduced, I am Bonnie Sweenor, uh, the director and founder of the Johns Hopkins. Disability Health Research Center. Um, 
And my visual description is I am a middle-aged white woman with shoulder length uh, blonde hair wearing a dark shirt and glasses. And I am grateful for the chance to talk to you all today about um, using data to promote accessibility. And this is a topic that's very important to the center uh, I direct and the work that we do. Um, Our center is really focused on using data to advance equity and promote accessibility for people with all types of disabilities. And our tagline is shifting the paradigm from living with a disability to thriving with a disability. The majority of people working in our center, students, staff, faculty, are people with disabilities, including myself. And we are very focused on partnering with the disability community in all of the work that we do. But certainly, um, data gaps are also of critical importance to us because they hold back um, the work that we do and the opportunities of impact that that work can have. And there are pervasive gaps in data on accessibility. So for example, there's really no standardized approach or methods for collecting data on accessibility in many places. While there is some standardization of collecting data on digital accessibility, there's many gaps in standardized methods for collecting information on accessibility in other places like in the built environment. Additionally, information about accessibility is very infrequently collected or part of national surveys, which removes opportunities to understand and examine accessibility or even inaccessibility. Um, in many of the settings where people with disabilities are living, operating, and hoping to thrive. All of that together means that we have many limitations in the evidence available for us to um, uh, highlight the pervasiveness of inaccessibility and gaps in access for people with disabilities. So those of us living this life certainly know those those, uh, gaps exist in accessibility but it is really important to have the data to to help quantify the levels of inaccessibility and help better identify where, when, and how those um, breakdowns in accessibility are happening. But in addition, having data on accessibility really is important from what at the center we call changing our posture from reactive to proactive. Because without data, Right now, it's really complaints and lawsuits that are the primary drivers of change. So I'm sure I don't have to explain to this group that when people experience um, inaccessibility and certainly uh, gaps in access and accessibility that are violations of our, our laws, it is up to an individual to file a complaint or put forward a, a lawsuit to try and make change. That's inequitable, that's expensive, and that takes a long time. It certainly is a very valuable tool and opportunity, but we also have to think about how we can invest in things like data to help with that process and to help identify, again, where accessibility is breaking down and try and make change before people are in those situations and have to put forward those complaints and those lawsuits. And so that's a process that at the center Um, I direct, we call disability data justice. It's the idea of using data to uphold and advance equity and justice for disabled people. Um, And we do that in a number of ways, in a number of places, and accessibility is certainly one of them. And this is a a synopsis of um, the process I'm showing on this slide. And I admit we have a few permutations of, of this, and I hope this is the most straightforward. So we think about using data Um, in a few ways. So we start with data in generating evidence needed to drive change. We're at a place and a time right now where often we are developing new methods and advocating for expanded and improved ways to collect disability data and data on accessibility. And that's because it just doesn't exist. That has to change. But when we get there, we then use that evidence to advocate and to inform policies that are disability inclusive, that promote equity and accessibility. And then from those policy changes, and hopefully also as a byproduct of that evidence, there's structural changes, changes to the environment, to systems, to structures, to policies, to places. And 
the goal is to develop those changes in such a way that there is an improvement in equity and accessibility for people with disabilities that we can actually measure and experience. We then, again, use data to uphold accountability. Data is important here because we need it to evaluate those changes and the impact of those policies to really tell if they're working, if they're not, if they need to be changed in some ways or other, and to be able to sustain those changes and improvements. Um, so we think about using data in all levels of this system of advancing equity and promoting accessibility. But again, the goal here is to help take the burden of upholding justice off the back of individuals with disabilities and creating data infrastructures that allow a greater system to move from that reactive approach to a more proactive approach to justice. We have done this in a few ways, and um, primarily the approach we've taken is in the development of what we call disability data dashboards. One of the first dashboards we created was during COVID-19, or still COVID-19, but during one of the initial um, um, peaks of COVID-19, when the vaccine was being rolled out, and was still very scarce, and there was limitations on access. And we had noted that there was inequitable um, opportunities to access COVID-19 vaccine for people with disabilities across states. Um, one of our fantastic undergraduate students actually um, elevated this issue. And in working with colleagues and with support of the American Association of People with Disabilities, we created a dashboard to compare and contrast those inequities. But in, in addition, we heard from the disability community that the inequities in how the vaccine was being rolled out wasn't the only problem. There was also barriers in access and accessibility of information on COVID-19 vaccines and the registration sites. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. So we expanded our dashboard to also assess that dimension of access and equity for COVID-19 vaccines. So this work was in partnership with the Center for Dignity and Healthcare for People with Disabilities, um, led by Dr. Kara Ayers and WebAIM, um, which has been a, a great partner of ours. And what we did is we collected data on the accessibility of COVID-19 vaccine information and registration websites from, um, uh, from health departments at all 50 states, DC, the District of Columbia, and five all five US territories. We were assessing this information and revising it weekly because things were changing very fast. And we shared the results of our scan and assessment of the digital accessibility um, on public forward facing publicly available dashboards. And we prioritized accessibility, meaning we ensured they were screen reader compatible, used plain language summaries and worked again with WebAIM in that process. So what we did is we scraped and collected this data from these websites. We then were working with WebAIM to um, assess and score how accessible those websites are. Um, and we came up with an accessibility score and rank ordered the states. What I'm showing on this slide is just a snapshot from one point in time when we were doing this work. And what it shows is at the time, this was actually right after the uh, vaccine.gov, the, the federal uh, site came out, even though it's listed under uh, a state site. And that actually had the top accessibility score, followed by Minnesota, Maine, Kansas, and California, and the list went on and on. In addition to showing our, um, our accessibility scores rank ordered uh, in a list, we also showed the scores in tertiles or thirds in a heat map form across the United States. So there was some um, understanding or ability to compare and contrast how uh, state accessibility scores were ranking um, across the country. We used alternative text on the dashboards and we also presented this information in other formats such as text and in, um, in, in graph form. This information in general basically um, informed a lot of our following work, but it really did highlight that um, there were addressable but persistent inequities in the pandemic response for the disability community that, that 
really circled around lack of accessibility and lack of focus. Um, we've published this data. I can provide a link at the end of this talk um, to links to, the, to our dashboard, which is still up, and the resulting paper. We learned a lot of lessons from that approach and from that dashboard, and we continued to expand and to use that disability data justice approach to look at other aspects of life. So another dashboard we have is focused on SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And we looked at how accessible that process of enrolling in SNAP was across states. We looked at different dimensions, how flexible um, that process is. Did you have to apply in person? Could you do it online? How efficient it was in finding information and the accessibility of the process of applying. We scored and rank ordered those, those scores, or I'm sorry, those states. I'm showing on the slide a graph of the turtiles of those accessibility or those scores again. And what we found here wasn't too different than what we saw during COVID-19, is that there really were place-based inequities. What I mean is that individuals with disabilities who are trying to enroll in SNAP may face barriers due to accessibility and simply because of where they live. And oftentimes when we think about place-based inequities, we don't often think about disability, but clearly we should, and we think this data elevates that. We've also expanded uh, most recently to a transit disability data dashboard. Um, this is great work by um, one of our trainees, Erica Twardzik. And what um, Erica has done is look at uh, transit systems that have received the most federal funding and scored them across different aspects. So how accessible their facilities are, their vehicles, how disability inclusive their policies are, how they offer accommodations, scores on paratransit, and how accessible their information is online and their maps. Now, admittedly, for all of our dashboards, we are limited to publicly available information because this information is not collected in any standardized way, and this type of accessibility information is largely not um, included in national surveys. So there are limitations to the work that we've done, and we know that. But we do think it is still important to begin this process of building these data infrastructures to promote the idea that we need better disability data, or I'm sorry, accessibility data and disability data to understand where things are working, where things aren't, and to help promote a more accessible and inclusive society. We have a few other dashboards and we're working right now on something we call the Disability Equity Scorecard. Um, we're doing some work in Maryland and hoping to expand soon nationally that will be a bit more comprehensive and looking at how accessible and equitable spaces are within communities for people with disabilities. Um, and I'm just gonna end with a few comments about what I think and what I hope um, data for accessibility um, um, in the future could address. So basically the needs. The first are closing those gaps on standardized methods. We really do need to develop a core set of questions or metrics to assess accessibility. Those types of core metrics and questions are then helpful to rolling out the collection of information about how accessible spaces and places are across national surveys. Having a standardized approach is really important for interoperability or the ability to stitch together and link data sets. That gives a lot more information that can collect information on transit to information on food access to information on housing and employment. And that really is critical to understanding the interconnected web of impact of inaccessibility for people with disabilities. Additionally, um, I think that it is important to look at accessibility data through a lens of advancing equity and supporting accountability. These data need to not just give us a better understanding of how accessible or inaccessible places and spaces are, but they also really do need to drive and uphold policy changes and structural changes that then do lead to better equity um, for people with disabilities. And of course, if we are going to uh, develop data and metrics for accessibility, it has to be community-centered. These metrics have to be informed by and centered on the perspectives of disabled people as a researcher in disability spaces. And I'm sure I don't have to say this to many of you, too often these things are developed outside of our community. 
that absolutely cannot be the case. And with that, I will stop and take questions. Uh, what I have on this slide is our website where you can access all of our dis disability data dashboards, which is disabilityhealth.jhu.edu. Um, I have my email, which is, uh, I'll put in the chat, it's probably just easier, um, but it's bswenor, S-W-E-N-O-R, at jhmi.edu. Please feel free to email me if you want to learn more of questions. And a quick plug for our podcast included, which we haven't done much on lately, but has some uh, interviews with folks on this call and some, some good information about the work we're interested in. With that, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sweetheart. We appreciate that. Absolutely fascinating. What's really interesting, too, is the fact that there's so much more to be uh, learned uh, from the template that you've already begun and then moving that forward uh, over the next uh, several years uh, to, to come to the conclusions, if in fact there is really a conclusion to come to. So uh, uh, as, as that goes along. All that being said, again, thank you. I'd like to open it up for board members, United States Access board members uh, to ask questions uh, or make comments uh, on the presentation today. So if we have any board members, uh, please uh, raise your hand or, or uh, whatever and we'll, we'll make it work. Uh, anybody have a question or a comment? This is Bonnie. Well, people are thinking, I'll just say that I put a link to our, our dashboards um, into the chat so that people can interact with them. Um, I'll just add one last thing as people are thinking of questions, if, if they have any, because we also believe in sharing our data. We don't believe we own the data. And so all of our data are downloadable. And please, um, we hope people use it and interact with it and give us uh, feedback. Thank you. Heather, did I see you? I'm on a smaller screen. Uh, if somebody just jump in, uh, if you have a question. This is uh, Ben Nadolski. I was just gonna make a quick comment and say that um, data is really critical. So really happy that you're providing it and doing this work. Um, disability community needs that um, to be able to kind of, we have a lot of stories, but to be able to give uh, act, uh, you know quantitative evidence is also very helpful as well. So thank you so much. Yes, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And you know, I'll just um, say, you know, we don't believe quantitative data is the be all and end all, right? It is important. But like you said, I think it is an important companion to the stories and experiences. I think in our view, um, you know, the the lack of of quantitative data though has limited the ability of those stories and the the fierce advocacy of the community and having the impact that it should. And so we're hopeful it can it can help push it further. Definitely agree with that. All right, I know that Heather, thank you very much. I know that Heather's got a question, Heather. Yes, my question was, um, do we have any idea of how this could be helpful for AI applications? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think of how AI could be used here in a few ways. Um, so one is we are trying to investigate how AI actually could be used um, to help automate, automate our data scraping. Um, so to make this process more streamlined, we imagine a world in a place where we could um, better produce this data and update it in a faster, more timely way and others could replicate it. So that's one way. But if you're thinking about bias in AI, um, you know, I think there is certainly opportunities where a similar approach could be used to track impact. So if you're thinking about how AI is being used in hiring practices, you know, you could uh, maybe compare and contrast um, the approaches and the protocols and strategies, and then, you know, perhaps link it to the outputs and outcomes, um, just as an example. The other thing I guess I would think too, and what as far as accessibility, and, and we always think about across the whole process of data, um, is how accessible the data collection is, right? The data that's not there in AI is certainly leading to the bias and why is it not there? And so I think something else to just think about and, and maybe ways we could consider how, how data can impact that. I'd have to think more about it, but it's a really important question. Yeah. I believe there was, go ahead. 
Hi, this is Stephanie Inyard. I wanted to know if you have any thoughts or if you could pontificate on um, the NIH announcement about disability as a health disparity and, and what that might do for research like yours or, or other important research within the disability community or about the disability community. Yeah, um, well, thank you. I think it is a, a good, uh, <laughs> good thing that has happened. Um, this is another great question. I, I will admit this work has been very hard to fund and largely beyond AAPD has not been funded and has been a labor of love um, by so many just unbelievably dedicated people working so hard um, that I'm indebted to forever. So I hope that that designation will open more doors. I think our hope is that it will help elevate the need for more funding to go to these issues even beyond NIH. Um, but I think time will tell, but it, it definitely has resulted in a few more funding opportunity announcements. Um, but, I, but I am more hopeful. It was a really great question. Anyone else with a question, comment? I think Katie Kale has a comment. I did. Thank you. I did have a question and more of mostly a comment, but then a quick question. You know, this is exactly um, what is needed right now. And, um, you know, we, at GSA, we follow the data. Um, we like to say, we, you know, you need to measure what matters and, and that that's going to tell us what, um, what how we're uh, implementing policies and making sure we're on the right track. I'm, I'm curious, just what, what is, what's next for, um, for you? Where, where, what are, what are we going to be hearing about, um, next time we talk to you? So all contingent on funding, <laughs> but, um, we are, uh, working on that, that disability equity, uh, scorecard. We're also pushing hard on the accessibility of healthcare spaces. So hopefully we will be doing some work there. Um, we are also starting to, to find opportunities to update and revise our, um, our dashboards. So what we would love to be able to have is to track change, right? And we want to know if there has been change over time with the existing dashboards. And then we're also really interested in linking the data we do have from our dashboards and outcomes. Does this, you know, how can we see if this is having an impact? And there's a lot of work there. I think in an ideal world, we would also be looking at other places, um, like housing is something that's also important to us. And so we're starting to investigate funding opportunities. There's an infinite amount of places where I think the work is, is needed and we get a lot of requests. Um, and we're, I, you know, I feel a bit like a broken record. We're just um, as limited as the funding and, and I think the, the staff to do it. But I think you could possibly apply it to many spaces. But uh, thank you, it's, a, it's an appreciated question. Brian Bard from HHS. Good afternoon, thank you for the presentation. So I work for um, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. And since you mentioned funding, I have to ask if you've ever looked at our funding mechanisms or collaborated with us? I sure have. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. We have been unsuccessful. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yes, we are constantly uh, trying. <laughs> Please keep trying. I will. <laughs> Any further questions? Madeline Rubolo has a question. Madeline. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for this excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm curious uh, about your transit dashboard uh, specifically. I'm wondering um, if you have communicated with any of the agencies that you've evaluated, and if so, what kinds of feedback that you've received? Because I, I think this would be really useful information for transit agencies to have. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. We're actually um, having some meetings in the next week about 
how to best do that, admittedly. So where we're landed is we don't just want to have direct communication of, you know, here's where you are. We'd love to be able to help those um, um, transit agencies to make sense of the data and to give them some advice on how to best use that data to drive change. And so we're working through some messaging and some approaches on how to do that. But um, I know, uh, I think Kelly uh, Buckland is on this call and, um, you know, we've we've had some conversations at that level, but but yeah, we need to do some outreach and that's our, that's one of our next steps as well as we are actually expanding that dashboard um, to include more more transit systems. So that, that I should have added, that's coming uh, probably in the not too distant future. Thank you. And I, I work for one of the transit agencies um, listed on the dashboard. So I would love oh, to- Oh, well, yes, please. I would love your feedback on how we could best be supportive. You know, I'll, I'll just add here. I'm always, I think we're always thoughtful about how to do that kind of outreach because we want to entice good change, right? And what we've learned in the past, and we've learned a lot in the past, is you know there's many different responses to data. Um, and I think that when you supply people with the data and the data are the data, and we're very transparent in, our, in how we've approached the data and how we've collected and scored the data. But the message we really do want to give is here's where you are, here's where you could be, and here's how you get there. And um, we think that gives a really th the best response and opportunity for, for good change. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's so little benchmarking data like this oh. for transit accessibility that it, it will be really valuable. So thanks again. Yeah, you know, what we've, again, I've learned so much in this process about uh, so many things, but that has been one of the overarching feedback points across all of our dashboards is in a lot of these issues and a lot of, you know, the settings on accessibility, whatever the scoring, you know, group is, states, transit systems, we've done one for universities, there's no awareness of where they are compared to others. And that actually is a really important driver for making change and understanding if you need to do better. Um, and so I think you're exactly right that that wasn't our primary focus, but now has become a really important one because I do think it does drive change. Yeah. So, Karen, did you have your uh, hand up, or was that, was that a comment? Uh, I was just making a comment. This is Taryn. It was an earlier comment, just as a, a thank you for everything you do, Bonnie. But also, I was reflecting that I'm very excited to to see the updates to the transit pieces because it's such uh, a critical component to employment. So, thank you. Thank Excellent. you, Taryn. Grateful for all you do. <laughs> Any further questions from Dr. Sweeter? Yes, Mr. Greg, this is yes. Elber. Please, Elber. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, dear Ms. Bonnie, thank you so much for that presentation. It's very interesting to know about the access and also the data. Mm, I'm just curious to know um, in terms of diversity. How diverse has been or how diverse you want to go in terms of collecting data? How successful have you been in terms of reaching out different minority groups or just different community groups such as the uh, LAC or Latin American community groups in African American community where people with different disabilities are just in terms of a big number and also a lot of issues or you know different circumstances? Um, just wondering about that. Yeah, so a really important question. So for the accessibility data, it's about location, right? Not individuals. So we're collecting data on a geographic or a policy or procedure level. So we're not collecting data from individuals, we're collecting data from environment system structures. However, we do believe it is critical as a potential next step to go beyond you know, state levels and our transit data can get us there in some degrees to look at areas that have differences in the diversity of populations that have historically been underinvested in and to understand if there are differences in the level of accessibility by those spaces and places. Um, I'll also add that we do data on another side of this work, which is collecting individual data and examining disability data for individuals. And what you're elevating about intersectionality is very core to what we do because we 
um, do believe that you need to look at these issues through that lens. Um, and so, you know, not just as our team and our workforce um, through perspectives, but we are are striving to, um, in our work, not just examine the differences by disability status, but the intersectional differences for people with disabilities from other underrepresented groups, race, ethnicity, um, and SOGI data, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity groups, um, as well as geographic location. So, you know, I think all of that taken together is exactly what you're saying. We need the data to understand that level of, of how people's lives are impacted by where they live and the levels of um, barriers that they face. And it's, it's important to think through multiple dimensions um, and to look at the data in that way. So, so yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. We, we, we absolutely have to do better on that. Um, and I hope thank that you, you. can get us there. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Excellent, robust comments. And uh, Dr. Thank you for the, for the answers. It's uh, quite uh, exciting to see what your work has done. And, and I, I know it's empowered others to think about that. And I hope the partnerships that you're striving to uh, continue uh, to maintain and increase is, uh, is good for, uh, for you and uh, also uh, importantly good for all of us. So thank you very much for, for taking the time to do this. We, we gratefully thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for allowing me and, and thanks for all the work you all are doing. Much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. It's uh, now for us to begin the uh, next portion of our uh, meeting and that would be the uh, standing committee reports. Uh, that being said, uh, we're gonna begin with the uh, technical programs committee and uh, we're gonna let uh, Mr. Uh, Elver uh, Ozen, uh begin with that process. Elver? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share a report of the Technical Programs Committee, which met on Monday afternoon. Scott Whitley. Technical Assistance Coordinator presented the fiscal year 2023 technical assistance request numbers and gave us a few examples of those numbers break down in relation to number one, type of inquiry or request, phone and email, number two, chapter of the ADA slash ABA standards, number three, category of request for the 50A slash ICT questions. It could be technical, testing, or other. Number four, Scott also gave an update on the work being done on the technical assistance guides. Now, in relation to Mr. Josh Shaw, sorry if I didn't pronounce your last name correctly, sir, training coordinator presented the training and statistics for the physical year 2023. He also presented information about, number one, the recurring webinars and agency, that's 12 built environment webinars, and six 508 slash ICT webinar. Number two, archives for both webinar series, as well as continuing education credits available, where archives are located, important to say. Number three, customize targeted training efforts to cater information relevant to the specific audience. Number four, use of access board YouTube channels to broaden training options and provide information to a wider audience. It could be publicly available and or unlisted for those with direct link. At this point, this completes my report. I'm not sure if there's any questions or comments. Thank you very much. I don't think so. So thank you, sir. I go back to you, Mr. Gray. No, thank you, sir. I appreciate your uh, report, your report of your uh, committee. Moving on, we're going to go to the Planning and Evaluation Committee. And at this point, I want to call on uh, 
uh, Ms. Hanna uh, Abdez uh, to give the report. Ma'am. Hello, thank you, Greg. Good afternoon, I'm Hanna Ibanez, Chair of the Planning and Evaluation Committee. The Planning and Evaluation Committee met on Tuesday afternoon. The committee heard an update from staff on our pre-visit to Los Angeles in preparation for our 2024 out-of-town meeting, which will be held April 16th through April 18th in Los Angeles. As someone who lives and works in LA, I am thrilled that the Access Board will be coming to LA to learn about our local accessibility challenges and to hear directly from our residents with disabilities about their experiences. We will be holding a public town hall on the afternoon of April 16th at the California Endowment Center for Health Communities in downtown Los Angeles. If you are in the Los Angeles area, please save the date and we hope that you will be joining us. Planning for the April meeting in LA is ongoing, but we expect to focus on accessibility issues that affect individuals with disabilities in the entertainment industry. From our pre-visit, we understand that there are a number of barriers in this industry specifically, and we are looking forward to learning more in April. In addition, we will be focusing on the accessibility of major events and public transportation in the Los Angeles area. In our committee meeting, we also set the dates for the 2025 out-of-town meeting, which will be held in New Orleans on July 8th through 10th, 2025. If there are no questions, that concludes my report. Thank you, Hannah. Appreciate your report. Look forward to Los Angeles next year. Next, we have the Budget Committee. Uh, Benjamin Nadolsky. Benjamin. Thanks, Greg. Uh, during the Budget Committee, we met. Uh, we went over on uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, we reviewed the 2023 uh, fiscal uh, budget, 2023 fiscal year budget. Um, we are operating within our budgeted amount. Um, there are still additional activities being um, kind of wrapped up, so we will receive a full 2023 budget report in, in the January uh, meeting. Uh, second, we looked at the um, fiscal year 2024 budget. It has um, been approved for a full requested funding level um, by OMB. And then third, we looked at the 2025 uh, fiscal year budget request. Um, and from that, we are still waiting uh, to hear back from OMB. Uh, nothing additional to report. You there, Greg? Sorry, I did not uh, hit my thing. Uh, thank you. I say thank you very much for uh, uh, your report. I'm glad to see that we're in budget. And now we're going to move on to the next uh, report, uh, which is the Frontier Issues Report from Madeline Revolo. Madeline? Thank you, Mr. Chair. At yesterday's meeting of the Committee on Frontier Issues, the board heard two excellent presentations. Dr. Nat Caspi spoke to the board about her work at the Tasker Center for Accessible Technology, where she is creating a comprehensive transportation equity program. Her topic, How Can We Advance Disability Justice in Mobility and Transportation, described her program, which covers three key elements, including community-centric design, transportation data equity, and capacity building tools. Her research focuses on engineering machine intelligent solutions for customizable real-time responsive technologies in the context of work, play, and urban street environments. She discussed how she has developed and evaluated sensor and mobile applications for personalized navigation and routing in pedestrian ways and improving personal automated mobility devices. She answered questions from the board. A second presentation was given by Dr. Yoda Trevoranis, the director of the Inclusive Design Research Center and professor at OCAD University in Toronto. Dr. Trevoranis spoke to the board about her work in developing a Canadian regulatory standard for the Accessible Canada Act on Artificial Intelligence Systems, standard CANASC 6.2, Accessible and Equitable Artificial Intelligence Systems. The proposed standard ensures that people with disabilities can participate fully in designing, developing, and using AI systems and are treated equitably in AI-based decisions. 
The standard addresses two concerns absent from other AI ethics standards, statistical discrimination and cumulative harm. She answered questions from the board members. If there are no questions, Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. We appreciate the good uh, information from that report. We will now uh, move on to the uh, Election Assistance uh, Commission. And uh, it's either uh, Hannah again or Benjamin uh, for the report. Which one of you two colleagues will be delivering? Hannah's. All right. I do not have a report. Oh, okay, then I can, I have it here. So, okay. Go ahead, Benjamin. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, ben Adults. Uh, Hannah Banez and I serve in a statutorily defined role as Asset Access Board representatives with the Election Assistance Commission, or EAC. On Monday, Commissioner Thomas Hicks gave an excellent presentation to the board on the work EAC does to fulfill its mission to support election officials with improving the administration of elections and activities to help all Americans participate in the voting process. Commissioner Hicks was assisted by Ben Jackson, Senior Voting Accessibility Specialist. I had the, fort uh, I had the fortune of working uh, to work with both gentlemen in person back in April during the annual meeting of the EAC Advisory Board. Commissioner Hicks gave an overview of the founding of the EAC with the help uh, America Vote Act, HAVA, their promulgation of voluntary voting systems guidelines, certifications of voting systems, and accreditation of testing lab laboratories. Commissioner Hicks also described their grant programs, information clearinghouse, and most recent clearinghouse award winners, the Clearies, a program that showcases initiatives in accessible voting. Ben Jackson gave an overview of EAC accessibility resources for election officials and a briefing of the EAC testing and certification of accessible voting systems. Both of those programs are based around VVSG Voluntary Voting Systems Guidelines. The EAC website is newly refreshed, and I would encourage everyone to visit eac.gov slash voter dash accessibility to learn more. Finally, I'll mention that the Technical Guidelines Development Committee is scheduled to convene on December 5th. Further development of the VVSG is our main agenda item for that meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all for the report. Thank you very much. All right, we are moving on and uh, uh, we will move our design guidance uh, report to the next uh, meeting in uh, January. And so that being said, we will move to the outreach uh, committee. Uh, all of these next few committee reports are under the uh, ad hoc committee report. And uh, as it relates to the outreach, uh, we've heard from the uh, committee's final report uh, and uh, on the uh, special committee on outreach here today is dissolved. And so therefore uh, we thank uh, KR and uh, uh, Phil uh, for a job well done. Uh, that resolves that matter at this particular time. Moving on to the public rights of way uh, committee report. And uh, before I turn it over to, to Chris, uh, it's a, uh, uh, want to thank everyone for uh, having officially published the public right-of-way uh, rules and, and regs for the federal register. Uh, the committee uh, on public right-of-way is hereby dissolved. Uh, while we do that, we certainly don't want to dissolve our people because we need to give them a, a huge round of applause. Uh, first to Chris Kaczynski, Sacha Bavadin, uh, Scott Winley, Juliet Schultz, Wendy Marshall, Francis Spiegel, uh, all of, to all the board members and staff who participated in this over the past uh, several years. And we appreciate all that great work uh, that went into that. And so uh, uh, a personal thanks uh, on behalf of uh, people with disabilities everywhere. Uh, this, is, uh, this will affect, as everyone knows, uh, almost every inch of uh, the outdoor space. Uh, when, as it relates to uh, access for people with disabilities and, and travel. So uh, we will uh, be able to move forward on that. Uh, Sachin, any comments from you uh, on the uh, public right of way by chance? All right, sorry. All right, the federal agency updates. Uh, we now move to the uh, 
that aspect of it. Is there any of the federal agencies uh, that would like to make comment? Uh, please raise your hand and uh, participate. Thanks. All right, Rex. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Greg. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up on uh, some news, some work that the agency is doing. Uh, my name is Rex Pace. I'm the federal liaison for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We recently put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking um, and had a comment period on uh, considering we're considering updates to section our section 504 regulations under the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, this is the part of our responsibility uh, where we have requirement accessibility requirements on on uh, people who receive financial federal assistance from us, and, and we expect them to make their programs and activities accessible. Runs the full gauntlet facilities uh, procedures. Uh, pretty it's very comprehensive, and I want, we want to um uh express our appreciation to the access board uh they really helped us publicize the comment period we and uh the access board has a a, a really strong outreach that can reach a lot of people and so i think that uh, helped us get a robust response with a lot of substantive comments so thank so many uh some thanks for the access board for helping us with that additionally uh we have done several joint trainings with access board staff on accessible housing um we did some of several of these at conferences and in particular the monthly webinar series that the access board offers uh, got a good response uh, good participation we look forward to that continued partnership with the access board and then um finally just want to remind everybody that the uh, department of housing and urban development has its own technical assistance program to help people uh, who have questions about the accessibility requirements of the fair housing act the Fair Housing Act has design and construction requirements for accessibility, and that's we offer that assistance through the uh, Fair Housing Access, Fair Housing, uh, the Fair Housing Accessibility First uh, program. Uh, we will we're going into another year of the program. We'll have additional new webinars and all kinds of stuff. You might be interested if you're looking for general overview stuff or uh, deep dive technical issues. We offer that. Just do a web search for uh, Fair Housing Accessibility First, and you'll turn up our website. And with that, I appreciate the time, and I turn it back over to the chair or others who ha may have comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rex. Appreciate that. Uh, the chair also has made an error here. Chris Kaczynski, were you supposed to, I believe I, I forgot you or missed you uh, in the uh, conversation with regard to uh, public rights away. Do you have additional comments that uh, you would like to make? I, I don't want to, uh, uh, I, I skipped you and I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine, Greg, thank you. I would defer to the comments from the chair and from the executive director concerning um, PROAG and the, and the uh, special committee that was established to su support the development of the regulation. And as you correctly note, uh, pursuant to our bylaws, um, that committee is dissolved because its work is completed. And I add my thanks to um, everybody uh, who has uh, been part of the process much longer than I have in most instances uh, of getting this to the finish line. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Absolutely my pleasure. And again, uh, sorry for missing you in the, in the queue as uh, indicated. Any other federal agencies at this time that would like to uh, uh, make a, a comment uh, to the open floor at this point. Uh, Katie Kale from GSA. Yeah. Greg, you all, you know that I always love talking about the great things that GSA is doing. Um, so a couple updates. Um, first, I just like to always make sure that we're, we're being open about the um, uh, uh, complaints that come to us from the USAB. Um, to GSA, we had in 2023, we had seven complaints um, and four of those have been resolved to date. We anticipate resolution on two of the remaining complaints by the end of the calendar year. And then the final two are in review um, between uh, GSA and the, uh, the lessers of the buildings um, that are in question. So those are buildings that we don't own, but that we lease. And so we're working with the lessers there. So um, happy to have those numbers coming down. 
Um, in terms of how GSA is implementing or adopting our um, PROAG uh, um, uh, 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 portion of the process, we uh, have, let's see, our, our regulatory impact assessment session um, section of the rule will be completed in the next week or so. Um, and then GSA will clear the rule and send it over to our friends at OMB OIRA for interagency comment, which will take um, approximately one to, uh, or I'm sorry, two to three months. And then once those comments are resolved, GSA will publish the rule, which will take about a month or two. So I'm going to make sure um, both as the deputy administrator of GSA, but also the, the vice chair of um, the U.S. Access Board that we are moving those um, uh, along as quickly as possible. And then third, um, I think some some good news and in, in, in how GSA can lead the way. Um, we are uh, uh, going to be providing accessible charging spaces for electric vehicles, um, along with regular charging spaces for our GSA or our actual our um, government wide federal fleet. Um, and so, in addition to providing these these charge the, these accessible charging spaces. We've also developed a policy and shared it with our vendors and contractors as a baseline for access compliance. So this is something that they can use not only when working with the federal government, which uh, has a really large federal fleet, um, but also when working with state and locals and other um, and um, other uh, companies as well. So that is uh, my report out on what GSA is doing. Um, so back to you, Greg. Thank you for the opportunity. No, thank you for your time and participation. I uh, I like the flags too. I I, I think that uh, when you become chairman, uh, Scott, I I'm going to have to get some ordered in for myself at least for, for a little bit. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> All right. Any other folks from the uh, uh, federal agencies uh, who are members that would like to uh, have report? All right, we'll close the federal agency updates and move to new business. Any new business that uh, needs to come before the, uh, the body at this time? Excellent, all right. Seeing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting and uh, uh, we will then uh, move to uh, adjourn uh, and uh, note that our next full meeting is uh, January 22nd through the 24th, 20, oh, 2024. Uh, and this is a virtual meeting also. Uh, so everyone listening and watching, uh, check your uh, Access Board website for more information on our January meeting. Uh, and we appreciate that. Do I hear a motion now to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. It's been moved. No need for a second as a motion to adjourn. Thank you all very much. And we will uh, see everyone soon. Please keep in touch for the next few months. And uh, thank you all for the hard work. It takes an awful lot to get to where we need to uh, be able to, to uh, produce one of these uh, uh, meetings. And so uh, special thanks again to Sachin and the entire team at the United States Access Board. Uh, heroic work and, and we're certainly uh, grateful for, for all that they have done. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. And this is Rosemary, US Access Board. I'd like to thank Dina, Mike, and Amy for your uh, assistance during our public meeting. We stand adjourned. Thank you. And pu public members of the board, please stay on for your training. This is only for the public members for the board. Mike Brennan signing off. Thank you all. <laughs>